All right. So the first thing I, uh, I learned from listening to people speak last night was I'm very, very bad at PowerPoint. So uh, you're not going to see any pretty PowerPoint, but I'm just going to show you a few slides just to kind of tell my story. And then uh, I recognize that very few people care per se about my particular story, but more about how it affects you guys or kind of things that I took away from my story or that, uh, that you guys can do the same. So you can, uh, you can see the title of my, uh, my presentation. Actually, I can thank Amanda for this. Is uh, From Do Ushbeg to Do Good Man. Uh, and you'll see kind of how that manifests itself and what, what that means. So this is what I used to look like. Uh, somebody earlier today said, oh, did you, were you really like that? And I said, absolutely. So uh, I graduated from Columbia University in New York. Uh, there we go. There we go. Uh, and I always say the easiest job I ever got was working at Goldman Sachs. Because when you go to a school like Columbia and a place like New York and you have no idea what you're going to do, you put your resume in for Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. They interview you. You get the job. And all of a sudden, you're an investment banker. Uh, and so if you can imagine. 22 years old, you show up at Goldman, they give you these nice business cards. I had fancy suits, my hair was pretty slicked back. Uh, I joke around, I was even so douchey, to, for lack of a better term, uh, that when I went out in New York, I would wear my Blackberry outside my jeans, because at that time, only investment bankers had Blackberry, no one else in finance. So you'd be out at the club, you kind of roll it out of the holster slowly, play with the trackball a little bit, and, and then put it back. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, it's just kind of, uh, it's just what you did when you were 22. And uh, believe it or not, at the time, I actually did think I ruled the world. Uh, and so, uh, so, needless to say, I was going down a certain path. Uh, and if you guys met me then, you would have, you would believe that I would never be wearing sneakers and that I would still work at a place like Goldman Sachs. So very quickly, when you work at a place like Goldman Sachs, you realize that uh, a few key things. And so for me, it was kind of two moments that really kind of led me down a different path. The first one that's quite obvious is that you realize uh, you're not, you don't have the ability to influence people. So you know, one of the things that you hear a lot of people talking about over the last few days and it, part of Zappos and Downtown Project is change. Um, I always use the word influence, right? Because not all of us can change the world. Not all of us can change a city but we can all influence people, right? And so I can influence my wife if I had one. I can influence my employees. I can influence all of you guys in this room, right? So we can all influence people. And, and you very quickly realize at Goldman or investment banking, you're not going to influence anybody, right? And so that was something that led me to believe that although they were paying me a lot of money and I had this cool holster, uh, that eventually I was probably going to have to move on and do something different. Then I had this moment, you can see what I mean, not great slides, but uh, uh, so it was what I call the good, better, and the best moment. So uh, we're sitting there in training, and we're doing five days of training, and they're teaching us how to model. And in a place like Goldman, the coolest kid is the kid who can do all the modeling in Excel without using his mouse. It's, it's odd, but that's kind of a point of you know, pride, and, and, uh, and you're the cool kid. So they're talking about methods for modeling and doing all this stuff. And the guys talking about it in Excel, there's always kind of the good, the better, and the best way. And so you, know, you see everyone shaking their head. And he's going, hey, this is the best way to do everything. And that's what those five days were dedicated to. For me, I kind of was sitting there and going, well, let's talk about not Excel, but how this kind of applies to what I'm doing kind of in, uh, in life. And I think right, there's always a good, a better, and a best of what you, can, what you could be doing in life. So for me, I realized, was I good at being an investment banker at Goldman Sachs? Absolutely, I was really good at it. Was I the best that I could be, or was that the best thing suited for my skill set or for what made me find happiness? I very quickly realized that wasn't the best for me. So uh, for those of you who saw the uh, All Hands on Meeting for Zappos yesterday, very similar to the death kind of valley analogy, right? You have these nascent things below, and a lot of us don't realize until uh, we're forced to realize that there is other options, right? And so you hear a lot of people talking about how the best thing that ever happened to them was they got fired from a job, right? Because it, it causes you to have these reflective moments where you go, hey, look, there's probably something I'm best at. And so um, for me, it was kind of this moment where I said, I could keep going on, and you know, they'll give me a new BlackBerry when I go work at KKR next year. And I'll, you know, again, think I ruled the world and, the, uh, and that type of thing. And I said, yeah, but that's probably not what the best thing for me is in terms of happiness or how I can kind of influence people. And so for me, 
Okay, uh, so so basically, it led me to uh, become an entrepreneur. So uh, when you're 25, uh, you come up with all kinds of ideas. So my brother and I uh, decided to basically just start coming up with all kinds of ideas, and we would have these weekly think tanks, and then we basically kind of challenge ourselves to see which we thought had the greatest chance for success. Um, so our concept was basically to become entrepreneurs and start uh, an alcohol brand. So. This is our uh, test bar in our creative office uh, in LA. So you can see from douchebag to that guy, quite a transformation, I would hope. Um, and so I'm just going to give you, again, this is not about my alcohol brand, but just to give you a little context, because then I'm going to spend most of the time just talking about things that I've learned through, through my journey. Um, but you're probably asking yourself, why the heck do they have a guy who sells booze for a living on this stage, right? Uh, after all the good talks yesterday and people coming up here, uh, it is a little odd. Um, but I think the reason why they asked me to speak is really what we're trying to do is do something different in alcohol. So our tagline is a better way to drink. What we were trying to create was an was a alcohol brand that was basically equal parts better products, better company, uh, and better cocktails. And so uh, as you can imagine, right, in an, in an industry like alcohol, um, trying to be a better type of company is a very foreign thing. Um, Richard Branson included us in his last book, and his whole take on the brand was kind of how we were screwing business by usual by trying to get people to make sustainable choices in the alcohol industry, just like they do in, uh, in, in other categories. Um, so again, won't bore you with it, but you can see everything from members of 1% for the planet um, to being the first carbon neutral spirits company to having distilleries that run on wind power. Everything we do is about uh, this better company. So again, this is where I want to spend the most of my time because again, I just wanted to give you my story to kind of give you some context uh, and then from there kind of talk about some of the things that I learned uh, and hopefully as, you, as we go through these, some of them will be obvious because there's a lot of people in this room that are doing a lot of amazing things um, and some of them maybe are obvious but allow you to kind of reflect and kind of think about some of the things that we learned. So, uh, so the first one is kind of every entrepreneur needs a sense of recklessness. So I left Goldman Sachs, thankfully, when I was 25. And I always joke around. I was kind of just young enough and just stupid enough to think it was a good idea to leave my nice cushy job with my BlackBerry in my holster. Um, and so, but I really mean that, right? So as all of us get older, right, you have kids and a family and mortgage. And you have people telling you, you're crazy. You can't leave your day job. I'm sure people tell Tony all the time he's not going to be able to affect change in downtown Las Vegas through the downtown project. So I think for all of us, anyone who's trying to create change, you have to have that recklessness, right? And you have to have that kind of bravado, and you really have to embrace it. And so, you know, a lot of it's funny. I, uh, whenever we get press in the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal, I get all these guys that email me from my past finance days. They're like, man, that is awesome. That is so cool what you're doing. And I realize it's because they don't have that recklessness, right? They're too in the mix. They don't have that kind of that sense of kind of bravado to basically go and leave and do it. But they all really want to be a secret entrepreneur or something like that. And so I think kind of finding that recklessness, kind of turning an eye towards people that say, hey, it won't work, or it's an awful idea, or kind of like, uh, again, for those of you who were in the room yesterday in Zappos, the elephant, right? You have to put aside that sense of rational reasoning and just go with kind of what your gut's telling you, what your instinct's telling you. Uh, and for us, it's, it's been a great thing. Uh, the second thing that, it, you know, I always am very honest with this is that a big learning for us is, so people say, oh, you're a social entrepreneur, right? We do all this stuff around social responsibility. And I really say, I'm an entrepreneur, right? Uh, and if the more that we're successful, the more that our social image will be pushed. Uh, I can tell you quite honestly, one of the things I was disappointed about when we started the brand was we used to really sell the, the sustainability part of it. Uh, and honestly, people just don't care that much, right? It's alcohol at the end of the day. So um, we really quickly realized, right, the way we can affect change, right, the way we can influence people is by continuing to be successful. Uh, and that's kind of what I mean, kind of doing good as the icing on the cake. We used to sell it as the cake. A lot of people sell it as the cake. Um, when you look at brands that have been successful, right, uh, I think my next sub bowl, so I won't steal my own thunder, uh, Warby Parker and Tom's, right? They're really successful consumer brand, brands that happen to have a social responsibility mission, but they're not really in the, right, that's kind of a secondary-ish, right? The best thing that Tom's can do or the best thing that Warby Parker can do is be a really successful consumer products company, um, and, then, um, and then the good kind of comes kind of the second part. 
uh, again, not, not an obvious one, but again, something as part of that. What we've learned, especially in, a, in an industry like alcohol, is that um, people want to do good, but they want to do it the path of least resistance, right? So hence why Tom's works and hence why Warby works. Oh, I get to buy the shoes I like at a price point I like that are pretty sturdy and this kind of thing. Oh, and then I feel better about my decisions, right? So um, it's something that we've realized whenever you're trying to get people to make changes in their life, uh, realizing that it's kind of what I call the light bulb theory, right? They're not gonna go out and buy new appliances. So just start with getting them to change a light bulb and that can be a catalyst for a lot more changes after that. Um, yeah, pointing it out there. Okay. Uh, and then one of the things that just again from our experience, that's uh, I think kind of applicable for anyone trying to do something social uh, is when we first started the brand, we said, hey, we're gonna be really transparent and for every bottle we sell, we're gonna donate a dollar back to rainforest preservation. And we started this sustainable acai project and we were doing all this amazing stuff. And then we really quickly started to grow and that dollar became really expensive. Um, and we quickly realized that although our minds and our heart, I guess really our hearts said it was a great idea, that we realized that it just wasn't a sustainable model. Um, and so again, when you look at what we're trying to do, Tom's, Warby, all these brands, they're finding sustainable business models that happen to be doing good um, because that's how you become a lightning rod in the industry for change, right? So because of our success, you're, we're starting to see other alcohol brands doing similar things. That's great, that's fantastic, right? It means we're influencing change um, by being successful versus going at it in a way where you're, we're trying to be quote unquote social entrepreneurs, right? Um, and it's a small distinction, but a big one. You know, one of the things obviously that's big uh, when you come to a place like this and see what everyone's doing is just kind of talking about community and that type of thing. And I mean, one of the things that I'm most excited about and that we spend a lot of time tracking is just the ability to use technology to identify um, people that are really your 1%. So trying to figure out who's most excited about our brands and things like that. And so we spend a ton of time, we go, look, we wanna influence 100 people, right? And I think in the old days, everybody would go, let's go to try to influence the 100. And it seems obvious, right? But it's really, sometimes it's more difficult, right? So in our, in our example, somebody will say, hey, do you wanna do a party for 2,000 people? And at first you go, oh, this is great, right? I get to go do it to 2,000 people. Uh, and then we realize the best way to probably do it is do 10 of them with 20 people. And so um, we use a ton of technology these days to try to basically coax people out, right? So on social media and digital, we're always doing things, kind of dangling the carrot or like the little mouse trap, if you think about it. And we're kind of daring them to run across the floor. And when, we, when they run across the floor, we grab them, we engage with them, we try to build community with them, uh, and then kind of give them the tools to then uh, go forward and kind of share our, share our brand message. Um, this one kind of about changing behavior um, is, again, when you think about trying to affect change, think about the alcohol industry, right? People have been drinking the same brands for 20 years and people right, have been making not unsustainable choices, but they haven't been thinking about it in, in an industry like this. And so what we found is that it's really important for us. Uh, I stole this from Blake at Tom's when he spoke to some of my employees the other day, but he was talking about relentless incremental change, right? And so that's how they thought about it and we think about it in the same way, right? If we can influence or change one person's behavior, five person's behavior, 10 people's behaviors, you realize how quickly it adds up. And so again, for us, it was always about, hey, we wanna change the whole industry, right? We wanna get over here but there's a lot of things that have to happen between there and there. And so we're, we try to be very methodical about kind of, hey, let's win a bunch of these little battles and eventually it will kind of ripple and create a catalyst for obviously much greater change. And then the last thing that, uh, that I've kind of learned along the journey uh, is that sneakers are a lot more comfortable than, uh, than wing ticks. So thank you guys very much, I appreciate it.